Hello, it's Sarah from Heart Grover Hearts, and I'm here today uh, to share my judging for the semi-final round of the Book Tea Prize for uh, group, Fiction Group A. Uh, so I have been a judge through all of the rounds so far and will judge also in the final round. Uh, so it means I participated in the octafinals, the quarterfinals, and then the round I'll, I'll talk about right now is the semifinals. And uh, in this round, I, like all, I received six books. What's different about this round is that uh, I've read them all. <laughs> so yay me. Uh, I, and I, I actually felt like I was cheating. I talked to Robert about it, but it, it, it was fine. I've read them, you know, so I can judge on them. And more importantly, to do the job uh, that happens here at the Book Two Prize, uh, which is to stack rank these six books. So when you stack rank the books, uh, you know, you could have six books that you didn't like, but the question is, which one did you not like more? <laughs> or which one did you, did, which, which was worse of the not liking and which were uh, least, least offensive? And so, you know, that's something to consider. Uh, it's not that I necessarily love all of these books, but there are certain ones that rose higher in my estimation than others. And that's the trick in this, in this judging is to be able to articulate why one was able to, to rise above the others. And so as I did in the last, in the last few rounds, uh, and I created a playlist with, with the other ones, if you'd like to go back and look at those, uh, I really, I'll, I'll expose any kind of bias that I have coming into the book because I think those are important. I think context really matters. Uh, if you read a book when you're in a great mood and things are going great, you may have a better experience than you, if you read it when you're in a funk and things are not going right for you. Or if you have a relationship or if you, if you loved a previous work or hated a previous work, all of these things come into how we weigh our, our reading experience. Um, so I'll expose that so that way um, you know uh, and can can judge my judging, uh, so, as it were. So let's get started because there's a lot to talk about. And um, so the first thing is I'm going to start from the bottom and move my way up. Uh, and so in last place, and this is exactly similar to the low ranking that I gave it last time um, in the last round. This is Lanny by Max Porter. Uh, so I'm not going to talk too much about this, but you can go into, I did a much more thorough review in my last, in my last, uh, book two prize judging, but ultimately, uh, this is a fairy tale story and fairy, ta fairy tales are just not my jam. Uh, I don't like that darkness and that creeping and the, uh, the mix of creepy and, um, and non-earthly, uh, the, 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 the kind of mix of fantasy and creepy just is not my thing. Uh, and that's really what Lanny offers. Uh, and so it, just from the, from the, from the get-go, it was not probably not going to be one for me. Now it's hard because I walk in with a bias toward Max Porter because I find him to be a very interesting person. I've seen him and spoken with him when he came to, to East Bay Booksellers here in Oakland, and it was just a fantastic night. I loved uh, Grief is the Thing with Feathers, and I think his work is very interesting, and I like what he's doing. I like how he's using these experimental uh, ways of writing, plus poetry, and, and, and going in this direction, but this is just not the book for me. Uh, we have a brief synopsis. This is a story of Lanny, who's a young boy, uh, precocious, uh, interesting. He kind of see, he's kind of connected and sees things and experiences things and says things that uh, other people don't. And so he comes off as a little odd. His parents are, don't really know what to do with him, but his mother comes up with this idea that, that maybe they can pay this very famous artist who lives in their small English village uh, to give him lessons. And that actually works out very, very well because they're both odd <laughs> and they have something to teach each other and they form this really interesting bond. Uh, that part I adored. I absolutely love that. I thought that was beautiful. And, uh, but then there's a character called Dead Papa Toothwort. And this character is kind of this otherworldly being kind of made up of moss and the, the detritus of natural detritus in the village. 
and I could never really get a sense of does he reflect the village back to itself or does he absorb the village? Um, and a lot of his, the way he talks and what he hears and, and all of these things are, are kind of flowy, flowing um, script in, in the book itself. And it was just very jarring to me and disconcerting. And then there's uh, another character. Uh, she's kind of a hippie lady named Peggy, and she's kind of like the sage who sees everything and is kind of like that old wise woman who knows what's really happening, uh, both from this other otherworldly uh, aspect from Dead Papa Toothport, as well as what's going on day to day in the village. Um, I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, just suffice it to say, this was not for me. And uh, while I re still respect Max Porter and I'll give more attention to his work and try, still try with him moving forward, uh, this one was number six for me. So let's go to number five. So number five place, I have 10 minutes, 38 seconds in The Strange World by Elif Shafak. Uh, my bias is toward Elif Shafak. I think she's an interesting woman. I respect her as a woman writer in Turkey. I know she's being persecuted by the Turkish government because of what she writes about. Uh, and I've read Bastard of Istanbul before and, and liked it. Uh, so coming into this, I was expecting to to enjoy it, both because of her as a person, because of previous writing, and also because of the material. I really like found family stories. I like underdog stories. I like women who, uh, who live life fully and are kind of on the wilder side. So all of that sounded like it was going to be a good, a good fit. Walking into the story, because of the title, I had this assumption that timeline was going to be very, very important. So we have 10 minutes and 38 seconds. Uh, and I also knew that that you open with her death. And so we have uh, Tequila Leela, who is uh, left. She is brutally murdered and left in a trash bin. And we start with her her leaving her body, her basically her body shutting down in the 10 minutes and 38, 38 seconds that it takes for, the, for a body to actually die. And, you know, interesting premise, interesting premise. But what didn't work for me with this book is that we have all of these characters, a whole host of characters. So we have her previous family that she was born into, and then we have this new family that she that she adopted once she left her home and became a sex worker in the city. Uh, we, we have, all, we have these, the, this duality of like the body and, 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 and the mind. And, and we, we focus on her as she's kind of leaving her body and all these, these senses as they start to shut down, start to spark kind of uh, the release of these memories. And so we get these of, of her past and her family, and then also where she meets these friends and how she falls into this. And then we have a shift into her friends trying to solve the murder. And I found that the friends, specifically the friends portion, really left me uh, wanting. There, it felt very, um, it didn't feel connected to the characters. They felt very flat. Some of it could be because of the, because of how fast you went through, you, you, we cycled through them. And there just wasn't a lot of depth there. So they felt very shallow in kind of caricatures of what you might find in a, a friends to be of a sex worker. And so it all kind of felt a little too stereo, too, too packed, too, spe too not specific. Um, and, and too much too much showing and not enough telling. Uh, there were just a lot of things that were told to you. And I just, could, I just couldn't find my way into feeling for this, which is horrible because, you know, you're reading about a woman who was killed and is left in this, in this trash bin. Uh, so I, I was just upset. I was upset because I, I wanted more from this. Uh, so for that reason, it, that is in number five. Let's go to number four. Uh, so another one where I really, really wanted to love this book. I this book uh, ha I went and saw it at its its premiere. I saw 
the author, speaking with one of my favorite authors uh, ever, which is Rebecca Solnit. Uh, she led a conversation with Ocean Wong of On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. And I found Ocean to be so interesting and so tender and soft and kind and compassionate and thoughtful. And I, I, I just felt like this could be a really fantastic book, but it completely fell apart for me. Uh, what's, let me talk about the story. So the story of On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous is... It sets itself up as an epistolary novel written in letters to his mother. Uh, we have, we have. It, it feels semi-autobiographical, uh, but it's supposed to be a novel. We have a young Vietnamese immigrant, uh, young young man, who is writing to his mother. He lives with his mother and his grandmother, uh, both from Vietnam. His mother doesn't read, and neither does his grandmother. And they all, he also has a relationship with his American grandfather. We have, we have him kind of telling, kind of explaining his life and explain and reflecting stories back to his, to his mother. Uh, and while I love an epistolary novel, one of my favorite novels, A Fortune at Crossroad, is an epistolary novel. This is not an epistolary novel. Uh, it, it didn't hold the form. The form just kind of drifts away and falls apart uh, and, and to the point where I forgot that it was an epistolary novel uh, kind of in the middle sections. But there's so much here that could have been great. Uh, so the story itself is fantastic. It is about his coming of age. It's about his first love. It's about what it's like to be him in this in, in Hartford, Connecticut, but it's a different side of Hartford, Connecticut than we expect. It's a side where he is going, riding his bicycle to a farm and he's actually on a tobacco farm and he's working with farm workers uh, where he is in, falls in love uh, with this man, Trevor, who is connected to the farm. Uh, but Trevor is is dealing with questions of his masculinity and thinks that his what he does with with uh, little dog the the main character is this is a this is just a phase this is just what they're doing as kids he'll grow out of it uh, there's a, a huge a big big piece about the oxycotton pill mill problem that happens in this town you've got class you've got You've got race <clears throat> that, that's happening in this in this relationship that they have. Um, you've got addiction, and a huge part of this book is PTSD and and what war does um, to to people. And so there's a, a stunningly stunningly upsetting scene where it's the fireworks of Fourth of July, and his mother is tr is triggered back to Vietnam. And, uh, and the violence that she has felt and she feels in that moment and some violence that she enacts on, upon her son as, as it kind of, uh, the, the war kind of lives in, still lives in her despite her being able to escape. I ultimately, I, I, there was some of the, some of the things that I didn't like about the book was how it, it relied on the poet, poet side of it. Um, and didn't give me enough of just the straight story because the story is, is fantastic. But it, the writing tended to be bloated. And as I said, the structure just didn't make sense after a while. And, and for me, if you set something up that's that strong to just abandon it midway um, and then kind of add it back in the end, it just didn't feel like it, it held together. And the a lot of the bloated metaphors and the bloated descriptive prose just didn't were, was kind of cringeworthy for me. I will still follow Ocean's work and uh, follow Ocean as a as a writer because I find him to be fascinating. Uh, and I'm putting this higher than uh, than Lanny or uh, Ten Minutes and Thirty Eight Seconds for Me in the Strange World because. I felt more connected to the character and I felt more connected to these stories, even though they didn't, the, the way it was transmitted didn't work for me. Okay, number three.
Uh, so for, number three for me was A Woman Is No Man by A Tough Room. Uh, I really, I really love this book. This book um, made, uh, I, I love stories about women and I, I love uh, story, well, well told stories. Uh, this is a multi-generational novel, which I also like those as well. Um, this is told from a woman who starts in, uh, in Palestine and our main character, Isra, is a, about to enter an arranged marriage with Adam, who lives in the United States, but he's come back to find a wife. And his mother is, uh, Farida. And Farida is very, very uh, overbearing, and um, she also was was in an arranged marriage when she was fourteen. And this is the way it is, and it's the way it's going to be. Uh, they take Isra from she's she's enters into this marriage with Adam, and they immediately move to the United States in, in Brooklyn. And she has an, a basement, the basement room, and is immediately put it put to work and it's very very clear that her job is to create sons to create sons uh it's very oppressive her mother-in-law is uh complicit in keeping a cloistered environment and being very strict about what expectations are and is in essence um keeps cap keeps her captive and is is always watching is always watching her uh, it's very isolating and it's very painful for her. Uh, now, this this is in the, the 1990s. Then we switch to another storyline, and this is her daughter, uh, Dea. She ends up having four daughters, and each one is a disappointment because they're not a boy. And uh, Dea is is smart, and she's outgoing, um, and she's she's... Uh, living under the thumb of her grandmother, uh, because uh, as as it opens up, you you realize that her parents have died in a car accident, and so she is completely under the, under the control of her grandmother. She's smart. She wants to go to school. She wants to study, and she comes into contact with her aunt Sarah, and Sarah. Uh, it, it kind of opens up a new world to her and, and gives her access to things that she did not have, including some family secrets. Uh, this book had had everything. It was intimate. It, it was um, compelling. The relationships, the, the, the difficulties and um, complexities in the relationship and in the characters, I think, worked incredibly well. And I thought I thought this was a great book. So uh, for me, this was the third. So let's talk about what number two. Number two is something that I read when it first came out. And this is Women Talking by Miriam Taves. So this is a very, very unique book. This is almost a play-like structure where we enter this, this scene after the events have already taken place. The scene is in an unknown country, uh, in a cloistered environment, another cloistered environment, uh, this one of the Mennonites in a foreign country. And it's a very cloistered environment and women are given no freedoms. Uh, this is very patriarchal. What's happened is that the women find themselves alone for maybe the first time in their lives. All of the men, save one, have left the village because they are going into town uh, to, to get their other members released from jail. The reason those men are in jail is because they have been, been for years uh, drugging the women of, the, of, this, of this little village, of this community, uh, at night and raping them. Uh, and they have not been letting them know that that's what's happened. So gaslighting these women into thinking that uh, they were bad, that they were crazy, that that demons, that other things were happening to them, but uh, it never letting them know that they were the ones, their own, their own kinsmen were the ones that were raping them at night. Uh, this is based on a true story. I I absolutely respect the fact that Miriam Taves 
opened at the scene after th those events. So it doesn't come off as sensational. Uh, it comes off as really painful. Uh, and we're, we're opening with these women dealing with the, with the effects. And this is very fast. This is a fast follow after finding out that this had happened. And the police were, were brought in to and have taken the men away. So for women who have never been on their own, we have two families, two matriarchs, and, and their adult daughter and their, and their teenage daughters are all in this barn, and they're trying to decide their future. And they're at a crossroads. They have to figure out not just what their life is going to be like in the immediate next step, but they also have to think about their, their um religious future, their spiritual, their afterlife, uh, because they're so, their faith is so paramount into how they live their lives. So the uh, question is, do they forgive and stay and try to redeem these men and give them the opportunity for redemption? Or knowing what's going to not, what, what has already happened to them, and, and the danger that exists with their, with their family, including young daughters. Uh, there is a horrible, horrible scene of, the, of what happened to one of the daughters and what she's going to have to live with. Uh, do they leave? And do they try to find a, set up a new life? Now, understand that ha they have no money. They don't speak the language. They speak a completely separate language in this community than is spoken in this in this. In this world, they've never seen a map. They don't read, so they're helpless. Purposely, they've been kept helpless. And the tension and the unique situation that that exists here was compelling to me. Uh, there's authorial decisions made to have a man, uh, kind of a man who has been pushed away from the other men, who's kind of been seen as an outsider and therefore given lesser status, uh, to be the one who 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 takes the minutes of the meeting because that's how they run their, their, the Mennonite culture is they take meeting, they take minutes and they write all this. And so it's a, it's a, a, uh, switch. It's a flip of, of the normal system where the woman sits and takes all the notes. And so we see through his lens and he's writing all of these things down of what's happening in these women and their different perspectives and their different uh, ideas of what should happen and what has happened. Uh, this, there's, this is very sparsely written. It's very, um, it's very clean. It's, it's very, it's not uh, histrionic and overwrought. It's very, it's very sparse, uh, but it packs so much of a punch. But uh, I think this was, a, this is just such a powerful, powerful book. Uh, so that's why I came in number two. All right, my number one book uh, for the semifinals was Jacqueline Woodson's Red at the Bone. This is also a multi-generational story. Uh, this is the story of a few different people. Uh, first, we have, uh, we have uh, Melody. And Melody is, we open with her 16th uh, birthday party, and she is putting on a dress, a uh, hand-me-down dress that was supposed to be for her mother for her 16th party. Uh, and she is being, and she is, uh, it's being altered for her. And she wants to enter this party, uh, with a Prince song. And we get a sense of who she is and, and, and her, and her being a little chafed at having to wear a specific dress and all the, the meetings that her grandmother, uh, Sabe is putting, is putting on her. Uh, but she loves her family and she's very excited to, to get to this party. And we, we find out that the dress has meaning because the dress was originally meant for her mother, Iris. Iris, uh, was not able to wear this dress because Iris got pregnant from Aubrey with Melody at, when she was 15. And the, the trajectory that, 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 that had on this family, uh, has, is explored in this book. Uh, we have, what I love about this book is we have layers and each character uh, brings a, a different perspective into this. Uh, but there's a lot of love here and you get fully rounded characters. Uh, Sabe as the, 
as the grandmother mother is a woman who she and her husband Poboy they they have left Tulsa after the massacre that happened in Tulsa uh, where there was there was a significant um, wealth in the black community in Tulsa and the KKK burnt it to the ground and killed many, many people. It's one of the worst examples of racism in the 20th century in America. And she, she is always aware of that and always aware of what can happen. And so she has taken lessons and, and absorbed them and tried to, make sure that her daughter was raised in a way to always understand what could happen and what did happen. Iris is very smart and she's driven and she has goals and she knows what she wants, both both emotionally, physically, and intellectually. And so she struggles being a young mother and struggles with what does it mean that this happened, uh, that she got pregnant uh, with, in essence, her high school sweetheart. And what does her future look like? And does she have to sacrifice her future? Uh, so there is a, a lot about motherhood in here uh, and different ways that motherhood looks different to different people at different times and based on circumstances. Uh, I, I loved the lyric style of the writing and I just felt that this just had so much heart. I, I absolutely adored it. I, I read it in one sitting and was completely taken by it. Uh, I think that the the connections and, and the strong female characters that are shown in, in this book uh, really resonated with me and I just felt I just felt them. I felt like I knew them. And so for me, this was the number one book of the group. So that's it. I would love to know, have you read these books? Have you read any of them? Were you a judge in this grouping? What did you think? And uh, what predictions do you have for the next round? That's it for me. Thank you so much for joining me. And I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Bye.